I wanted to start with, uh, with this, uh, these covers. Uh, three of them are covers of science, uh, science fiction books and three others are covers of, of science magazine, uh, Nature and Science. So you can see that there is, a, I don't know if there is a convergence in the methods of science fiction and science, but at least in the, in the imagery, in the image, it's basically the same kind of, of thing. So, uh, and I will come back to that because it's important the way we represent uh, our discoveries to the public. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's important to think about it because if we say that we found an exoplanet that looks like that, uh, while we just have a, a transit light curve, uh, we may uh, convey a wrong image about what we know about the planets, you know, by trying to make something very realistic. So I will come back to that. So at least in terms of uh, visual representation, we use sometimes the same tool, as, not in our research, but at least to communicate um, with the public. Here is a picture of uh, where, uh, where I work. It's in Bordeaux. So it's the tram uh, stop and uh, behind the trees there is the, so here is the parking where we, where we, where we park the car and our building is uh, somewhere there. Why do I uh, show that? It's because the stop is called François Borde. François Borde was a scientist, a specialist in prehistory, very uh, important one and uh, he built the whole uh, uh, prehistoric research center at the University of Bordeaux. But he was also a science fiction writer. Uh, under another name, because at the time it was not uh, taken very seriously to write science fiction as a scientist, so he could have threatened uh, his career. And, uh, and Natasha is an expert on the story of uh, François Borde, so if you have questions about him, but I will show you uh, some of the books he wrote under, uh, under Francis Carsac. So this is one of the uh, uh, edition uh, at the time. This is a translation in English, so there are not many French writers who are translated, there are some, so Francis Carsac was one of them, and this is a very recent re-edition uh, of Francis Carsac, and uh, at the time, so it, he, he, he would not say to his colleague that he was also writing a science fiction. Now it's, uh, I would say it's okay, and maybe there, there is a big difference between France and, uh, and maybe uh, uh, English-speaking uh, world. A famous example is uh, Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne is a, is a very, very famous scientist working on general relativity, black holes, for instance. And uh, he was always fond of science fiction. He helped uh, Carl Sagan to write Contact because Carl Sagan needed a wormhole in his plot and, uh, and, uh, and Kip Thorne theorized the, the, the concept of the wormhole. <laughs> and uh, in, the, in the years 2000, he wrote a, a script for the, for the cinema called Interstellar. And first, and first he approached Steven Spielberg at the time, and Steven Spielberg was okay to, to write, the, to, sorry, to, to, to produce and direct the movie. And uh, he was okay to accept the rule of the game imposed by Kip Thorne, which was nothing in the plot could violate the law of physics and any speculations about physical laws that might still be imperfectly understood would nevertheless be grounded in principle that, well, at least serious physicists would discuss over a beer. <laughs> that was his definition of the rule. Unfortunately, at me, to me, because I really don't like the, the movie that uh, the Nolan Brothers uh, made, but uh, DreamWorks was sold and, uh, and uh, Jonathan Nolan, the brother of Christopher Nolan, was hired to write uh, the script and the script completely uh, forgot about this law. So there are many, many, uh, it's, it's a very weird movie because it, went, it, it was meant as a realistic movie, but there are completely uh, basic stuff that are not respected. For instance, you, you take off from the Earth in a huge rocket, which is realistic, but then you, you take off an, from another planet, which is the same as the Earth, same gravity, with a kind of small, uh, <laughs> like the DeLorean in Back to the Future, while they, they say they're very realistic about the black hole. So, they really forgot about that, and actually uh, uh, Kip Thorne became executive producer of the movie. He got the money from, uh, from, uh, from the, the producers to uh, actually to fund his research, to make new uh, models of black holes, and he got the, the, Nobel, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2016 for the discovery of the, of the gravitational uh, waves. So it means, what I wanted to say here is that you can write science fiction and still get a Nobel Prize after that. So it's not, we don't have the problem with Francis Carsac, etc. 
So that was kind of the, one of the most expected movie of all time. But it happened that it's, it's the movie we, we dreamed of never existed. Uh, what basically Richard Feynman is explaining here is that, uh, so it's a lecture, he's explaining that uh, science is imagination. But imagination in a tight straight jacket. A straight jacket is, you know, this kind of jacket that restrains you to escape, a camisole in French. And uh, this straight jacket are the known laws of physics. It means that in science, uh, you, uh, so basically, I try to, sorry, I try to, to illustrate this, this way. We have a core that we could call the consolidated science. It doesn't mean that it's, it's a truth written in stone. It means that it has some power, for instance, predictive power. You can use this consolidated science, for instance, to build technology, to make prediction, very, very accurate prediction. So that's the kind of thing that uh, we, we base our research on. And the research, basically, it was uh, what is between this consolidated science and the, the rest of the universe that is unknown, which is not understood in the same way, which is not modeled, which is not part of these uh, the things. And basically, so the game in research is that you can make hypotheses, you can invent things, just like a science fiction author would do, but you have to confront that to the real, the, basically you have to agree with uh, the consolidated science, although you can, like Einstein for instance, uh, did not contradict fully the Newtonian gravity, but he made it more comprehensive. But you have to agree with all the observations and uh, all the previous work that has been done. And what I, th I think very interesting is that this research layer where we are here, and basically we are looking at the unknown, uh, sitting on, this, uh, on the shoulders of, the, of giants, as it was uh, said before, uh, it's something that is very uh, unstable, that it's, it's not consolidated by definition, the research. Uh, there are uh, uh, controversy, there are discussion, there are contradictions, and uh, I don't know if uh, Laurence will talk about this after, most of the science communication is done about the research. It's not done about the unknown, it's not done about the consolidated science, it's done about the latest paper that was published yesterday, which was not being incorporated in the consolidated science. It, it requires years to be confronted with observations, and all the public is, uh, want to know about the research. So it was really clear during the COVID the COVID uh, pandemic, that uh, people were saying, oh, one day we, we are told this, one day we are told that, this contradict, or if you, if you think about Mars, one day uh, we've, we've been told that uh, there was water on Mars, the other day there was a contradic contradictory uh, uh, information. Well, this is what, how research works, but maybe this is not what we should communicate in priority to the public. What we should communicate in priority to the public, it's the science that has reached a consensus. Or maybe to communicate about the unknown because people need mystery in their life. And we, are, uh, we have the chance, we are very lucky to be uh, looking at something that somehow is supernatural in the sense that it's not yet incorporated in our consolidated knowledge. And, and, uh, and uh, people want to know about that. Uh, and we don't speak enough, I think, about what we don't understand yet in, uh, in science. And this extrapolation, we do it by expanding uh, our knowledge, but the science, fiction, the science fiction writer or author is looking at the unknown with his imagination, without the same straight jacket as the scientist. He could, he could have this straight jacket if he wants to. We call this part of science fiction hard science, where you really, they, the author really wants to be uh, exact uh, uh, relative to what we know. But you can, also do, you can also do Star Wars and don't care about the, the science. There are many, many ways in... Uh, but what I, what I mean is that if we don't speak about what we don't understand yet, uh, people who need mystery, everybody needs mystery, will go to take it somewhere else. So for instance, I keep one example in astrophysics. We don't understand the rotation of galaxies. Uh, galaxies rotate in a supernatural way. Uh, so we need to put some ingredients that we call dark matter uh, uh, to get 
what is observed compared to what we should have based on the current uh, theories. So we need this other ingredient that is, uh, that is uh, dark matter. There is the same for the expansion of the universe, which is accelerating. It doesn't work with the standard model, so we need to inject something that we call dark energy. Everything that we don't understand is dark. And it's a, it's a very important field of research because we think that here there is a breakthrough into a novel uh, physics. The physics of super high energy, super, uh, where, where, where the consolidated part of science is not doing a proper work at the moment. And it's, it's very important to say that uh, there is supernatural things in the, in the world. Uh, it's just not uh, on, on our doorsteps. It's not ghosts, it's not uh, aliens coming in our garden. But there are some very fundamental stuff we don't understand. And we, if we don't explain that to people and if we don't share this, uh, this uh, sense of wonder that we have in science, they will go to other kind of cheap mysteries like uh, the pyramids were made by aliens uh, a few thousand years ago, like uh, people like Avi Loeb will try to convince you that uh, uh, there is a dogma in science that prevents us to work on uh, things like UFO, or uh, who say that the first time an object is crossing the, the, the solar system coming from another one, ou moi moi, this asteroid or comet, or, uh, it could be a, a, an alien spaceship uh, crossing the... And, and these, these guys, they have a lot of attention, they have a lot of views on media, and we have to compete with that. So I think we have to sell a bit of mystery, and maybe science fiction is an ally uh, when doing that. I have two very important examples for me when I communicate to the public using science fiction. Uh, one is uh, Les Entretiens sur la Pluralité des Mondes, the Fontenelle, so Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds, which is old. It's from the end of the 17th century, and I love this book, and I, and I advise you to read it. It's short, and uh, it's uh, really fantastic. So the idea of this book is to look at the planets in the solar system, the known planets at the time, and the known moons, and to wonder what could be the life there, and, uh, and especially the life of a society, not really just animals, or uh, what could be societies on the Moon, on Mars, on Mercury, on Jupiter, on the moons of Jupiter, considering the astronomical properties of these bodies. So, for instance, if there are people on the Moon, what do they see when they look at the Earth? They don't see uh, human beings, they don't see life So for him. So maybe there is life on the Moon, just we cannot see. see. And what is very important in this book is that he makes a very clear distinction between what's the fact and what's the speculation. So you, you, he's not trying to explain that there must be life uh, on other worlds. He's not trying to explain that every star in the, in the sky is, a, is another sun with a, with a planet. Actually, there is a, an incredible uh, passage in the book where he says, I don't know, maybe this star has no planet. Maybe this star has two, three planets. Maybe this star has a very close by uh, planet. Maybe uh, he's already... Uh, uh, thinking of the possible diversity that the planetary system could take. And he say, I don't know, I'm just uh, inventing, I'm just doing poetry. But I'm using what I know from science to, for instance, he will say Mars. Mars is not very interesting, it's basically the Earth. It's a little bit smaller, it's a little bit farther away than the Sun, but it has a similar obliquity, Don't say seasons. The, the duration of the, the length of the day is about the same. I have nothing interesting to say about Mars because I don't see what could be different. Maybe it's a little bit colder because it's farther away from the sun. He doesn't know about gravity at the time. Newton was working at the same time on gravity, so he doesn't know about it. And at the opposite of that, there is an author, a scientific, an author with a scientist, an author which is very famous in French. It's called Camille Flammarion. And he works about uh, the plurality of inhabited world. And he's using a science to impose the idea that there must be, science tells you that there is life on Mars. And there is life uh, that is, uh, because of low gravity, there is life in the skies of Mars, much more than in the sky of the Earth. Uh, there is this kind of life on Venus, there is this kind of life on Mars, and is really having this uh, authority uh, argument to impose that. And, uh, and it makes a kind of a very blurry uh, distinction, there is no distinction basically between speculation and science in Flammarion. So it was very popular because it delivered 
the, the mystery and the interest, but he was not as rigorous as Fontenelle. And I think we pay, we pay today uh, uh, what uh, Flammarion did, at, le at least in France, in terms of uh, making people uh, believe that scientists were convinced that there was life on Mars, etc. Because of this kind of, uh, of way of, uh, of basically projecting what we have on Earth on other planets, uh, it's interesting that uh, basically, if you look at the history of the observation of Mars, and you see how it's described in the, in the literature, not in science fiction, but also in science fiction, it was like we were the witness of the end of a world, of a living world. Basically, at the end of the 19th century, there was a lot of life on Mars, there was uh, agriculture, there was channels, and uh, as our observing power increased, we saw that vegetation disappeared, and basically now life is in some niche under, under the soil and in the form of very simple molecules. So it was not seen as just the fact that uh, the progress of observation was revealing us the true nature of Mars, but like we were witnessing the end of a world that in, in just one century was dying. And it's really described even in scientific book as a dying world where there are only a bit of vegetation remaining. Uh, so I don't want this to occur when we observe exoplanet <laughs> with a growing uh, observability uh, power. But to, to show you how important it was, uh, in the French Academy of Science in uh, the year uh, uh, 1900, there was this prize, this award called the Guzman Award. It was, uh, it was a, a large amount of money for the time and it was meant to be given to anyone who would send a message to another uh, uh, object in the, in the sky, a planet, a star, uh, and receive an answer at the exception of Mars. So basically, if you send a message to Mars and you receive an answer, you don't deserve the price. Everybody knows that there is a civilization on Mars. We don't care. If you send a message to Venus and you receive an answer, you get 100,000 francs. So to give you an idea, this was sponsored by the French Academy of Science, to give you an idea of, of how, what was our representation of perception of Mars. I'm, I'm jumping to something completely different. Uh, I don't know if you know Sean Raymond. Uh, he was there yesterday, but uh, to record the... Uh, not to give a lecture, I think, but he has a, a website called Planet Planet. So you search Sean Raymond Planet Planet, and he uses, uh, he, he does kind of mind experiments, science fiction mind experiments, to teach you about uh, some uh, important uh, concepts in uh, astrophysics. Have a look, it's a great way to learn about, uh, for instance, planet formation. And uh, he has, for instance, he tries to build the ultimate solar system. So he, he, he tries to put as many habitable planet in one single system as possible. And it does it step by step. And, uh, and after some time, you find a new ID. So I think at some point, he managed to put one million uh, habitable planet <laughs> around the star using uh, black holes and, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, funny stuff using retro retrograde orbits. And uh, so have a look, it's really great. Another uh, way that science fiction has been used by uh, European Space Agency as a survey to look for uh, concepts or technology innovations that could be useful for space exploration and space application. So basically, they had this, uh, this cell of people uh, reading science fiction to see if there are ideas that could actually be useful for, uh, I don't know, the inter International Space Station, etc. So they discuss, for instance, I just took an example. Uh, they discuss uh, propulsion using antimatter. How is it described in science fiction and what, what could be uh, uh, possible applications uh, of that? Another thing that is not often uh, discussed is the fact that actually this trade jacket that, uh, that uh, uh, Feynman is talking about, as a scientist, we don't have a choice to wear it. We have to wear it. But why uh, a writer would want to wear a straight jacket like that? And it's because constraints produce creativity sometimes. When you, when you don't have the means, you don't have as many, uh, for instance, if you're making a movies, if you have too much movie, sometimes it's a crappy movie because you don't have to use your imagination to, to try to find a solution. A great example in cinema is the movie Joes by Steven Spielberg, again, is that they, 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 the, the movie was meant to be based on a giant shark, uh, mechanical uh, shark that never worked. So the director needed to find a way to 
convey the idea that there is a giant shark without showing it. And actually, it's a, it's a movie that is taught in cinema schools today because of that. So for a science, uh, for, for a science fiction writer, this constraint of law of physics can be a way to uh, create, uh, uh, to force the imagination to go where you would not go by yourself. And an example of that is a, a very famous uh, science fiction book called uh, uh, Mission of Gravity. It had two different uh, titles in, uh, in French. And uh, so the author, Hal Clement, uh, described in an essay uh, exactly why he did that. So the idea of this, of this book is that it's a planet with a very high gravity, very, very high gravity, that's rotating super fast. So it's a flattened planet like that. And uh, the idea is that there are some human explorers who need to go on this planet to recover a probe that crashed on this planet. And uh, the probe crashed on the pole of the planet. And because the planet is rotating super fast, the gravity that you feel is much lower at the equator than at the pole because of the centrifugal acceleration. So they can survive at the equator, but they cannot survive at the pole. So basically, the idea of the, and when he started to write the novel, he said, I don't know how they're going to do. I'm curious about how they're going to make it. I need to find a solution. So he wrote a book trying to find a solution. And in the book, there, is a, there are uh, living species on the planet. And he will use them uh, to uh, basically to make an expedition uh, with them to go on the pole and recover the, recover the probe. And he was really using the, this straight jacket of the law of, of science to find a new uh, uh, storylines, if you want, in this story. And that's something that uh, we should discuss with science fiction writers. Those who really want to be uh, constrained by the, by the science uh, are looking for that. They don't know the answer when they start to think about the book, and they will have to find a solution. So they are the first uh, readers of their story. They are the first to discover what's going to happen. Some uh, funny, uh, well, I think, entertaining stuff. So this is a stellar system very nearby called the Forti Eridani. So it's a triple system. This is Forti Eridani A. It's a sun-like star. And uh, it's orbiting with a pair of uh, two dwarfs. It's a, it's a red dwarf and a white dwarf. So this is a star that exploded and that became a white dwarf. And this is a, a red dwarf. And uh, it also has another property. This planet is the home planet of uh, the Vulcans. It's a home planet of Spock. If you, if you uh, in, the, in the Star Trek uh, episodes and movies, they say that Spock is coming from a planet around 40 Eridani A. And it's interesting because in 2018, a planet was found uh, around uh, 40 Eridani A. And uh, so the, 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 the fans of, uh, of Star Trek are really aware of this kind of stuff. And uh, they, they knew about that. And they made a lot of pressure on the International Astronomical Union. So we call this planet Vulcan. So at the time, I heard about that. And I say, but it's stupid. Because if you, if you call this planet Vulcan, and then in two years, we find another planet in this system that is more like the one of Spock, then how are you going to call it? You will have Vulcan. And then another planet that, no, no, that's the real Vulcan. And then another planet that, that this is really, really the new Vulcan. So at the time, I discussed with some of the fans. I say, maybe wait a little bit. It's too, it's too early. This is a giant planet. It's not really interesting. And recently, recently there was this paper, like uh, two weeks ago, uh, where actually they uh, find that so it was a radial velocity signature. So there was a variation in the, in the velocity of the star that, uh, that was interpreted in, in, eight, in 18 as a signature of the planet. And they found a correlation, a very strong correlation, with the magnetic activity of the star, which, uh, which means that the exact orbital period of what was thought to be a planet is actually the rotation of the star. And that's bad. When we find a, a, a radial velocity period that is exactly the period of the, of the rotation of the star, it's bad. It means that what we are, the, the, the change in the apparent velocity of the star is just due to some intrinsic motions on the, on the star. So this planet disappeared uh, a couple uh, weeks ago. So it was a good thing not to call it Vulcan. There might be some planets around this, uh, this system. So, but there are super interesting things I discussed at the time with the, with the fan of Star Trek and say, imagine here, here there is a, there is a, a white dwarf 
So it means that there was a supernova in this system. So what about the planet uh, here? What happens to the, the, the ancestor of Spock when, uh, when there was, and say, oh, that's super interesting. We need to write about that. <laughs> so there are things to, um, so it's interesting because we also have the planet in the solar system that was called Vulcan and that disappeared. Did you, did, did you know about that? So uh, I don't know if you know about the discovery of Neptune. Neptune was discovered uh, by, uh, uh, well, uh, there is a, depending on where, if you, if you read that hist historical book in English or in French, but at least there was this French astronomer called uh, Urbain Le Verrier, who actually he was looking at the orbit of uh, Uranus and he was saying it's not a Keplerian orbit. I can see perturbations from Jupiter, Saturn, but I see another perturbation. There must be another planet. And he was able to, to infer the existence, the orbit and the position of, uh, of Neptune saying, observe here. They took a telescope, they observed and there was, and, and he, here was uh, Neptune. So it was a really exceptional achievement. But then he also saw another unexplained uh, perturbation on the orbit of Mercury. And uh, the only, in, in the Newtonian uh, view of gravitation, the only way to explain that was to have a planet between the Sun and Mercury. And he called this planet Vulcan. And uh, he tried to spend all of his life trying to locate this planet or these planets because there was no uh, very satisfying solution to that. And the reason is that this perturbation compared to the Keplerian orbit in the, in the orbit of uh, Mercury was due to general relati relativity. It's called the, the advance in the perihelion of Mercury. And it was explained by Einstein in 1915. And so the poor Le Verrier with his uh, tool, a Newtonian tool, he needed a planet uh, between the Sun and Mercury. And it was very difficult to look at it because it's really towards the Sun. So it's not very easy to confirm or not. And he chased a non-existing planet uh, called Vulcan. And so at some point with Einstein, Vulcan disappeared. So there is a kind of, of tendency in Vulcan planet to disappear at some point. Uh. <laughs> this is a personal anecdote. So this is a, a, a plot that I made in 2007 because there was this, uh, for the first time, we discovered a system where there was a planet in the habitable zone of a star and a planet that was not a giant. It had a, a minimum mass of about eight Earth's masses, which could put it in the telluric or in the terrestrial range of planets. This star was uh, Gliese uh, 581, and this was planet D. So with uh, Jim Casting and other authors, we wrote a paper about the potential ability, ability, uh, habitability of this planet. We made some uh, climate simulation and stuff like that. And uh, it's actually probably my paper that's the most cited. And this planet does not exist. <laughs> Just like uh, Vulcan, its, correlate, its, its period is totally correlated with the rotation of the star and the activity of the star. So uh, it doesn't exist. So I've done science fiction. I have, I have, <laughs> I have written about uh, the, the climate, the properties of a planet that does not exist. So I am a science fiction writer and I'm allowed to give you this talk about science fiction. <laughs> Fortunately, I heard about that not in a, you know, not just, well, just one day it existed and the other day it was a long process and it was a long time ago. If it would have been found out uh, like uh, one year after that it doesn't exist, I would have re been really depressed. But now I can joke about it. So Alpha Centauri is the closest stellar system from the Sun. It's made of three stars. Uh, there is a, a pair, uh, A and B, a pair of, uh, of Sun-like stars. Very, uh, well, not very close, but uh, the two stars are separated by about 20 times the Earth-Sun distance. So about the distance between uh, Uranus and, uh, and the Sun. So there are two stars. And there is another one. Uh, planet, uh, sorry, star uh, C, which is uh, like 15,000 Earth and distance away from this pair. We call it Proxima because at the moment it's closer from the Sun uh, than this, this pair. It's Alpha Centauri C or Proxima. So it's a very, so this is not part of this system. So it's a very important system because it's very nearby, it's very bright at least for the, because we don't even see these uh, red dwarfs here in this uh, visible picture. So it's a, it, it's a, so here is a, a picture of uh, an X-ray of the pair here. 
And it's always been uh, very important, uh, of course, uh, STEM in science fiction. There is a famous uh, short story by Van Vogt called Far Century, Centuries. It's a very interesting concept, he developed that. And uh, the idea is that at some points in uh, human history, there is a spaceship that goes to, uh, to uh, Alpha Centauri because they know that there is a planet that you can uh, colonize. So they sent a spaceship. I don't remember in the, in the, in the story if uh, it's one, one of the three stars, I don't know, but uh, it's a travel that takes, uh, I don't know, centuries. So they are hibernating, they are sleeping. It takes centuries. And when they arrive to the planet, it's already colonized. It's centuries in the future. And when they arrive, they are expected. There are cities that have been built uh, with their names because they like heroes. Uh, that we, that because meanwhile they were traveling, the progress made the travel between uh, between Earth and uh, and Alpha Centauri very easy, and like people go on weekend and stuff like that. <laughs> so for some reason in the story they were never able to intercept the spaceship, and but they were they were waiting for. What is interesting is that that was an actual problem in solar system exp exploration, and in particular uh, to send the mission to Pluto. So uh, Pluto was a very, uh, very uh, early, a very key target uh, in solar system exploration. People wanted to see, uh, to, to learn about Pluto. But the first concept would take uh, like 30 years to reach, to reach Pluto. And uh, some scientists were saying, OK, if we send a probe uh, that will take 30 years to send a few kilograms to Pluto, and uh, maybe in 10 years, we will send a probe that takes 10 years to go with more uh, utility charge load payload there. And uh, it will arrive 10 years before the one that we sent. So it was actually an actual problem. And uh, at some points, when they reach uh, a, a travel time of 10 years, they decided that uh, it was OK. Uh, there would be no uh, prospects of uh, propulsion uh, that, could, uh, that could beat that. And they sent a uh, New Horizons probe. So there was a, a, an idea that's actually a real, a real concern when you want to, to send something very far away. Uh, there is a, probably some of you have read the, the, the three body problem and the, the sequels. It's very important because uh, it was a big success in uh, science fiction books and it's a, chi it's, it's a Chinese author. So it's, uh, and it's really, really good to read. And uh, the idea is that uh, basically there is a, an invasion from Al uh, Alpha Centauri which is not actually Alpha Centauri in the, in the book. It's called Trisolar. It's exactly at the same distance as uh, Alpha Centauri, but it doesn't have the property of Alpha Centauri. And that's a, big, a bit of a problem for us because uh, actually this book doesn't take place exactly in our universe. It's a kind of parallel universe where the physics is different. The, 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 the properties of the stars around us are different, but it's never said. And it's only the, the physicist or the astrophysicist that, that, that is clearly, uh, you know, that understands that we're reading. So I have a lot of questions about, uh, about uh, Alpha Centauri based on what is described in the, in the, in the three-body problem. But the idea of the book is great is that there is a, uh, we understand that there is a, a fleet of spacecrafts coming to Earth, probably with bad uh, intention. And we know it will take uh, 400 years and so we have 400 years to prepare. And it's this for the story of these 400 years. How do we prepare to this fleet, this threatening fleet of spaceships? That's uh, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, idea. And you see the evolution of society during this, uh, during this period. And from a Chinese point of view. Uh. OK, so just to say that it's an important, of course, it's also the theater of uh, uh, the most successful uh, movie in history. OK, Avatar. So in Avatar, Alpha Centauri A has a giant planet, and this giant planet has a moon called Pandora, which is uh, habitable and inhabited, and uh, where uh, humans go uh, because they are interested in the, in the resources of this planet, so you know about that. Uh, with Sean Raymond, we, uh, we worked a little bit about, uh, about that, <laughs> and we wonder, is it possible for uh, Alpha Centauri A to have a giant planet first? Because it's a very nearby system and we know how to detect giant planets. It's becoming quite easy. So for uh, such a bright system, 
we should have very strong constraints about, uh, about the planets on Alpha Centauri. So there is, there is still room for little planets, but not for a big one than like Polyphemus in the movie. So we look at the constraints from radial velocity and we say, okay, there is no place for a, gi for a giant planet except so this is how actually the system is looking from when you look from the Earth, uh, except if the Polyphemus orbit is on the plane of the sky, because in this case there is no radial velocity signature, because there is no radial motion in our direction. So, so uh, if the if the planet is in this uh, this orbit, uh, we would not see it, but. Because of the geometry of the system, this orbit is not stable. It will come back to the plane of the, of the two stars. So we, uh, we, we show that actually this, uh, this planet cannot exist. And we say, okay, it was a joke for us. Uh, but Sean was called by the, by, the, the, by the production of the movies and by uh, the James Cameron uh, team to be uh, consulting uh, on the next movies. So we were very happy. But actually, the idea was just for us to sign a non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I speak about it anyway. <laughs> so we were saying, oh, we are going to participate to the, to the Avatar sequel, but we never had a phone call, nothing, not a letter. <laughs> we were very sad. About representation of, uh, of uh, exoplanets. So if you, if you look about uh, uh, pr Proxima B, uh, the Proxima B exoplanet, if you Google it, you will find a really nice view of this planet, so uh, comparison between the Earth of uh, Proxima b, views, views from the planet uh, looking at the star. <laughs> and actually, the only thing that we know uh, <laughs> about this planet uh, is that it's, uh, it's a variation in the velocity of the star, which has a period of 11 days. Now we, we have seen a new uh, periods from another planet, maybe another one. So we don't even know the, the actual mass of the planet. So less, even less, it's radius. So uh, there, is a, there is an issue here because some people, they look, they Google, and they think we know much more about this planet than we actually do. So we have to think about, uh, we have to get interested in uh, science fiction and, and the speculation about what it is. Uh, because if we don't, we do it anyway, but without control. So we need to keep in mind that we are using uh, imagination and speculation as a way to convey our uh, scientific work. So we have to be conscious of that. Otherwise, we will do it anyway without having, uh, being aware of that. Uh, so the only thing that we know is that there is a planet, uh, there is a planet with an 11-day uh, period. Uh, we know that with the properties, it, it's, it's set in the habitable zone of the of the star. Um, I had here an, a, a, a scene from this movie, Battleship, where the, 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 the habitable zone is defined, but I don't have the, I don't have the sound, uh, so but I will try to, uh, I don't know if I remember, but basically it says, uh, if your planet is too far away, it will be frozen. If it's too close, it will be burnt. And if it's at the right distance, it will be perfect for life. And the guy is, okay, the scientist, uh, okay. <laughs> So I think it's a very short version of the lecture you had by Martin. <laughs> you should use it next time and then go walk in the, in the park. So another thing that's interested, inter interesting about uh, Proxima Centauri, and I am sure that Martin, you talk about that, is that because of tidal effect, this planet must be in synchronous uh, rotation by showing always the same hemisphere to the star, like the moon to the Earth, we, only, we always see the same face of the Moon. It's the same if this planet exists. Um, I'm always uh, careful about that. We think there is a planet. If it exists, we are very confident because we're using this consolidated part of science to say it, that tides should uh, lock it. And uh, so Martin, for instance, uh, is a, one of the experts of studying the climate of this planet uh, that have a synchronous rotation and which have a very peculiar climate. And actually, he, he was the first to work on uh, Proxima b uh, during his PhD and to make the first uh, climate model uh, of this planet. This was described uh, in a science fiction book uh, by Brian Aldis. What was it, the 60s or the 50s? I don't know. Uh, 
1962. Okay, so the early uh, 60s. So it has two different uh, titles. It's either Hit House or uh, The Long Afternoon of Earth. So the idea is that it, it's in the distant future of the Earth. And uh, in the view of Aldis and uh, his knowledge of tides, uh, the, the, the tidal interaction between the, the Earth and the Moon and between the Earth and the Sun has synchronized the whole system. So basically, the period of rotation of the Earth is 365 days. So it's synch synchronous with its orbit. And the Moon is also uh, in orbit of 365 uh, days around the Earth and around the Sun. So it's in the Lagrangian uh, point uh, of the system. And so uh, it, it, it makes a, it makes a, a, a fixed uh, triangle. And in the book, because everything is, uh, is kind of in a rigid motion, there are uh, spider webs between the Earth and the Moon that you can travel with the spiders from one to the other. But at least, they, so he believed that this was the fate of the, of the Earth. Well, actually, we know that uh, when the sun will became a, a red giant, basically the evolution of the of the of the rotation of the Earth and of the Earth-Moon system will be very uh, little compared to what we have today. It will not be a very big evolution like that. But it's interesting that uh, so here are some uh, climates. So this is done by Jeremy Lecomte, but uh, uh, Martin has. Uh, as also some uh, modeling. So, in uh, in uh, 2017, we announced the discovery of a very important system called Trappist One. Very important because it offers us observational uh, possibilities that are uh, completely unique. So there are at the moment more than 200 hours of observation with James Webb trying to characterize this planet. We were able to determine their mass with a few percent uh, precision. Uh, we, would, we are trying to detect, uh, to, to know if there is an atmosphere on this planet. So when it was, uh, when it was uh, published in Nature, uh, we, ha we were aware of this problem of uh, representation. So we wanted, we imposed actually to, to Nature to have a, a presentation where it was obvious that it was uh, some uh, model. Or some, so we wanted to have it like uh, put on a table, uh, and so it's not a uh, photography. So um, it probably conveys some ideas, like uh, there are some rendering of the planet, but at least we know that this is not an image of a planetary system. And what we did is that, so there was this uh, science fiction writer called Laurence Suner. She's, uh, she lives uh, in uh, Switzerland. And uh, so part of the, of the team, uh, we discovered the the system, there were people working in Geneva who knew, uh, well, who were friends with uh, Laurence. And uh, Laurence was aware of the discovery of the system very early. And she, she wrote uh, two short stories about uh, stories uh, occurring in the Trappist-1 uh, planet with the human uh, uh, settlers in the distant future. And uh, we, we, we had this uh, short story translated and it was published in Nature with the discovery of the, of the planet. So here is a science fiction story. So we had to, we had to read it carefully to, to, make, it, uh, uh, to make it very uh, compatible with what we knew. And actually, while working with Laurence, we found about stuff that we would not have uh, uh, thought about uh, without, for instance, what the appearance of the planets from one planet to the other. It's a very compact system, and actually, uh, uh, tonight, if the sky is OK, you can, you can see Mars and Jupiter. And these are just uh, spots that are a bit brighter than most of the stars, but that's it. Uh, in the, in the TRAPPIST-1 system, if you are uh, on this planet and you're looking at this one at the conjunction, it's like the, it's like the full moon. So it's, uh, it's interesting to, to, to think about that. And so, uh, and, uh, for the... So in the second short story, I was reading it, and uh, Laurence at some point mentioned a geostationary uh, satellite in the system. And uh, I thought about it, and I said, uh, I don't think it's possible. The system is too compact, and because the planets are synchronous, 
you need, uh, so for the Earth, the, the rotation is 24 hours, so you need a satellite with 24, hour, the 24 hours orbit, which is 36,000 kilometers away, it's, it's not that far. But here, uh, the rotation period is the orbital period, like on Proxima b. So the, 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 the geostationary, geostationary satellite must be at the Lagrangian point, like in the Brian Aldis uh, book. And I, and I told I don't think this is stable. So I discussed this with Sean Raymond, and Sean Raymond, oh, that's a cool question. I will make some uh, simulation. So he put a lot of uh, stuff in the uh, Lagrangian points of the system, and he made plenty of simulations. And now it's not stable; it goes away uh, very quickly. Uh, okay. So I told uh, I told uh, Laurence, no, you have to remove that. It's not uh, compatible. And years after. I discuss with uh, with Sean and I say, uh, oh, you remember when we did that? You said it was uh, unstable. Uh, so how quick was this instability? I said, oh, ten thousand years. Ten thousand years after that, it's uh, it's it's gone. So for us astronomers, it's unstable. We are not hoping to find uh, 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 an object there. But for settlers uh, on the planet. Phew, who cares about if your satellite is away in uh, 1,000 or even a century? I think the longest uh, geostationary uh, satellite we have uh, lasted like something like 20 years. So I called uh, Laurence and I said, I'm very sorry you could have let your uh, geostationary <laughs> satellite. Uh, we, are, we are really bad at, at this work, sorry. So sometimes you have to think about... Uh, of course, there is a famous example. Uh, uh, so... Uh, I told about Alpha Centauri, which, which is a, a multiple, uh, multiple stellar system. We are now finding uh, circumbinary planets, so planets orbiting around uh, uh, binaries, like this one. And uh, basically, so Star Wars is not a, a story based uh, on, on science, but actually this, this site, this vision, this concept, is actually uh, fairly simple and it works and there are planets like that out there and it turns out that we scientists we call this planet Tatooines. It's like the word we use uh, even in the title of the paper. So in this, in this paper they really put it far because they say uh, on the fate of unstable circundary planets Tatooines close encounters with the Death Star. <laughs> so the, they put two references to 1977 movies Close Encounters of the Third Kind by Steven Spielberg and Star Wars by George Lucas. So we are, uh, we are. Uh, so there are also systems where, uh, where uh, you have two stars, and each one of them can have its own stellar system. We also find that there are plenty of them, because many of the star systems are widely separated. So there is a, there is a lot of room in the in the system, and this was explored by again Brian Aldis in a series of books uh, called Heliconia, where actually, because of the stellar orbits, uh, one of the stars is, is a giant star, and when the, the star with the inhabited planet comes nearby, it makes a kind of season that, that lasts uh, for a brief period of time, but, and then there is a long uh, winter. So it's, it's interesting, and recently I was contacted by a science fiction writer who wanted to have a system with both stars having uh, their own planetary system and with inhabited planets on both, uh, in both systems. And uh, he wanted to have uh, some uh, kind of uh, um, climate change due to the orbit of the star. So I told him, well, it's complicated because uh, if you have, uh, like in, in Alpha Centauri, if you have planets, you can have the star that come very close, otherwise it would destabilize the system. So, and uh, I did the, the so I, I did two things. I gave him a Python code to build his planetary system, so he can uh, he can really add planets and uh, and see what happens and uh, see the change in uh, in insulation. Uh, there is no climate uh, work in that. It's quite simple. But when I did that, I played with it. I saw that there was always the same eccentricity uh, value, like something like 0 0.4, to have to maximize the change, the climate change uh, in the systems. And so I really wrote, wrote the equations and, uh, and I found that actually I can, uh, I can find a maximum in eccentricity. And so I, I, I will find time and write a scientific paper about that. And I will include the, 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 the writer in the authors of the, of the story. We'll end with, uh, 
with something that uh, I did for a science fiction novel that it was a lot of work and uh, I want to reassure uh, if there are science fiction writers in the room you don't have to do that to write a science fiction uh, book but so I was working on the effect of uh, obliquity on the planet so this is the earth which has quite a low obliquity so we have uh, polar caps and uh, basically the, 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 the coldest part of the earth is the pole and the hotter part is the equator but if we would have an obliquity higher than 50 degrees this would be the opposite in average during the year the coldest part would be the equator and the hottest part would be the poles. This happens sometimes on Mars because of this cha chaotic change in obliquity. And we see uh, the, the traces of uh, ice uh, on the slope, for instance, of the big, vo big volcanoes that are at low latitude. So we know it happened. So this is this shape. It's, uh, so this is the latitude. And this is the mean insulation as a function of latitude over a year. So we are here. And we can see that uh, the insulation is maximum at the equator and minimum at the poles. Okay? But above uh, about 50 degrees, so above uh, curves like that, we have this shape where the coldest part is the equator and the hottest part is the pole. So basically, uh, there are different uh, climate solutions. You can have, uh, depending on the obliquity, so if you, if you play with a, an aqua planet, a planet covered with water, you, ev everything that's red and yellow is liquid water. And everything that's blue, it's ice. So you can have an icy planet, you can have a purely liquid surface. So we have permanent uh, polar caps, you can have seasonal polar caps, and you can have uh, this kind of uh, icy belt on the planet, or uh, the contrary. So I was interested in that, and I say, oh, if I would be uh, a science fiction writer, I would be interested in a planet like that, where there is this, uh, this uh, impossible barrier, uh, very cold. And what about life that's here and life that's, that's here? They could have evolved completely uh, different, in different ways. And maybe there is a civilization emerging here and wondering what's in the other side. And maybe there would be some interesting stuff to write. So I'm not a writer, so I contacted, uh, I contacted uh, a, a science fiction writer and say, is this story interesting for you? He said, yes. And he wrote a novel about it. And actually, I, I did with the help of Martin. I did some uh, simulation of the climate of this planet. So and on this planet, you have, uh, you have uh, seasonal oceans at the pole that open and disappear uh, with time. So I can give, I can give him uh, the, the length of the day, the insulation, the, the, the sea ice. So here you see an ocean and it will, uh, it will close at some point. And here you will see the opening of the, uh, the southern uh, ocean. We have the temperature, clouds, rain, snow. And so, uh, so he, he did, you know, when you read a fantasy or science fiction book, sometimes there is this map, very important map that you usually, you'd, you'd never go back to it because it's boring to read the map. But it was interesting for us. So he, 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 he designed the map with uh, altitude uh, levels. And uh, Martin had a code to translate that into the topography of the GCM. So I really used the real uh, topography uh, to do the simulation. And so there is a continent called, uh, by the settlers called Australia in the novel. And I could provide uh, the weather. For instance, these are three days at the spring equinox. So uh, he could, uh, I could show him uh, what was the, the speed of the winds and stuff like that on the, on the thing. And uh, I can stop here on this crazy work uh, that maybe you will find completely useless uh, or I can uh, keep going for a bit but if you have questions I can stop here just tell me okay. so maybe just one concluding remark so with uh, Natasha we are uh, we have uh, founded a, a, a science fiction festival so she is the president of it she's the mastermind behind it and uh, last year, the topic was uh, um, hopeful futures, utopia. Basically, the, the idea was uh, uh, governments and politicians are not able to provide us a vision of a future that we, we want to go there. They are stuck with the, 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 the way the world, the society works now, and they, they are not able to imagine the future world that we need actually we need something to project so the idea was that maybe we can uh, we can discuss with science fiction uh, authors and writers about 
what could be uh, a future that is not a, a dystopia or uh, the end of the world, uh, the last of us or uh, Walking Dead, something more. Up and there is a, there is a, a how do you say, a, a, a science fiction genre that is emerging that is sometimes called hop punk or solar punk that is about that, that is about a different future. Uh, so that was the, the topic last year and we, we, we will, uh, so it's in French, but we will soon uh, uh, release the, the, the video because everything was, uh, was recorded. And the next, uh, the, the next topic would be monsters, which is also cool. Sorry. That will be in September near Bordeaux. So that was to end and uh, to say that we can do science. So the idea is to have scientists meeting and speaking with, uh, with writers.